So I'm pretty sure that something got ex post facto overwritten about the identity I used to have. And this is the characterization it's supposed to have now. Because what happened was apparently my old identity got repurposed and sold off to somebody else. And there were things that I did back in the day that I knew were illegal and I took the risk of doing them. And I never got arrested. I never got busted. I was never around anyone that got arrested or busted for those things and I understood what I understood about them. And now, after several years, I realized there were timelines when some of those things happened where I didn't get busted in any way. I didn't even get accused of anything. They would have seemed really mild. But then on the flip, I was doing something completely different. And now the flips come again. <laughs> and whoever got my old life <laughs> took those things that were really, really, whatever, very minimal at the time and did something else really big. And they want me to cover their ass for the stuff they did with the life of mine that they got and that they're wearing now by trying to use the fact that I was actually innocent when it came around again as cover up for what they did concurrently with my life that they were wearing. Does that make sense? It might sound a little confusing, but it's not. Now, I was supposed to start this off by talking about how the image that comes up on my desktop when I try to sign in is black and white, right? Kind of like me. <laughs> kind of like my blog used to be. You know that banner at the top? That looks like the Golden Gate Bridge with the fog rolling in. All film noir with some red. Do you remember the first vision I had? The first film noir? The only other color was the red? I think you do. Right? See, I had no idea at the time that anybody else could see that or it would mean anything else to anyone else because I would ask people direct questions, including people that claim to be professionals, and they would say, well, that's just an illusion. That's just an illusion. It's a symptom of your mental illness. We need you to stay on your medication. And so when it came around again, and I wasn't on medication, I kept track myself. So let's get something clear. I need to discuss and I need to be forthright about my history of drug abuse. I have abused drugs. I have. There was a time when I uh, believed that marijuana should be legal. I had done other uh, drugs uh, in a party aspect, not regularly. But I didn't drink alcohol. I never liked the taste of it. It just wasn't something I was really interested in. But then I met somebody. And I thought maybe he and I might be together for a long time. And I knew based upon where he came from and what was his desire that wasn't necessarily so incompatible with mine, but the lifestyle and social milieu that I had been used to up until then had a different concept of what was culturally appropriate. So I made some modifications and adjustments in my life. And for a short time, we were together in America and some of the things from my old life were not inappropriate. But at some point in time, we were parted from each other. And after a certain amount of time, I started to study a spiritual art. It was the first time in my life I really considered spirituality. And when I started considering spirituality, I didn't want drugs anymore. I didn't want to smoke pot. I had a problem with cigarettes. There was a psychological trigger I had because the person I wanted to be with had a very specific relationship with cigarettes. Actually, there was a very significant cultural history with cigarettes. And then there was the fact that I was in a different milieu that had very different politics that would talk about this concept of harm reduction and how smoking cigarettes was actually an appropriate harm reduction tactic or technique, especially if you might have some more high risk harms that you're contemplating and maybe having that cigarette instead would prevent you from engaging in that more high risk harm. So you become normalized to justifying it's okay to smoke the cigarette. Even if you don't have the respiration you would like, even if you don't have the stamina you would like, even if your get wrinkles, your teeth get yellow, well, at least I don't want to do those other things that I would be more likely to indulge if I didn't have the cigarette. You don't say it as a crutch when you believe in harm reduction. You don't use those kind of terms. Now, at some point in time, after I started getting more spiritually inclined, I left the city for a while. And when I was gone, I... And when I came back, 
I didn't want drugs. I didn't want pot. I didn't even really want cigarettes. I certainly didn't want to drink. That was not even on the radar. I had no temptation. It wasn't even really contemplated. If it was around me, which by and large, when I returned, the milieu I was in, wasn't around me. We didn't want it. There were people in the community, they had to deal with things the way they had to deal with it. I didn't touch marijuana. I didn't touch alcohol. I drink coffee with sugar. I know. I drink coffee with sugar. And every once in a while, I'd have cigarettes. Right? But then, somehow I ended up in California and things changed. Right? Because when I got there, I didn't want to drink. I didn't want marijuana. I actually stopped smoking for a while. It was amazing when I actually had an indoor place to stay, my own room. I'd been without my own room for a very long time. And then when I got my own room again, like in what was kind of like a, supposed to be a normal environment where I could like acclimate, all of a sudden something happened. And I had to go to the doctor. And I told the doctor that I thought one thing was happening and they just didn't seem to believe me. Or they had a different understanding of what they wanted. I don't really know because nobody's admitted it. Well, what ended up happening is that after that, I had treatment for a couple of days. I went somewhere for about two weeks. It was really, really intense. I was making this project. i been making it for over a year. And something told me it was evil and I had to throw it out. So I asked them to throw it out. I don't think they threw it out. So I ended up leaving. And they gave me a card. And I was gone for a while. And they gave me some medication. They said that I need medication because I had a chemical imbalance in my brain as a result of my mental illness and the medication would help alter my brain chemistry and then they would teach me, they would show me how to normalize. But all kinds of crazy things were happening. Oh my gosh. They called them hallucinations, but I would be on the bus and I could like hear people's phone conversations. I could see transmissions that later came up on the television. I would see my emails before I would read them. You know, hallucinations. And at some point, it got so horrible that I called them up and I said, can I come back? And they said, sure. We're going to send you to another address, though. And I went to the other address. And when I went back, one of the things I had to do was I had to stay there for several months. They called it programming. It was a dual diagnosis program. And even though I'd only been diagnosed with a mental illness, it was for people that were dual diagnosis, which meant mental illness and drug or alcohol dependency. And so every day, or at least every week, you were required to go to either, to go to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. And not just Alcoholics Anonymous, sometimes they would have Narcotics Anonymous. Now, you're not supposed to talk about anything anybody says or anything anybody does. And I wouldn't do that. But I had to listen to person after person after person talk about their stories. And they were programming us. And I'm sitting there knowing I'm mandated to be in these meetings. And I don't have an alcohol or drug dependency problem. I hadn't smoked pot. I hadn't drank beer. I hadn't drank, I was never a big alcohol drinker. I'd even stopped smoking cigarettes for a considerable amount of time until I was back in the program. And I'm listening to these people talk about these terrible things. And with all the other things that was going on, something in my unconscious, and I could, I could hear it, but I kept trying to ignore it. It was like, well, I wasn't that bad. I never did that. I never did that. It never, it was never, I never did anything like that. It was almost like I was supposed to compete with them. It was like we were in some sort of competition. It was so strange. You would listen to people tell their stories and then it was like this thing where you would compare yourself with them. And the thing is, there was no other input into your life to evaluate you in context of community. You see, when you're in political struggle, you're constantly engaged in self-analysis. And you're also constantly engaged in analysis of other people. You criticize, and they criticize you. Sometimes you hear about it directly. Sometimes you hear about it from somebody else that tells you. But when you're in one of these programs, the only criticism you get is about your drug abuse or lack thereof. And so when they're analyzing and comparing people, they're comparing them primarily based upon how they perform relative to their consumption of drugs. And it's the only feedback you get. No matter what else you talk about, all they do is take notes. But the only thing that I was getting was, are you taking your medication? How are you feeling? Have you been drinking? Have you been smoking? Have you been doing any other drugs? And then you're in group meetings, and then other people are processing what it was that they relapsed. 
and there's no other expression of you if you haven't relapsed and you can't relapse if you don't have a drug dependency problem to begin with. So after I got out, I started trying to get a job and I had to go through this process where part of what was going on is I had to prove I was too sick to work. I had to prove I was too disabled to be able to hold a full-time job. And even though I'd been in a program for several months, apparently the proof had not been proffered that I was too disabled to work and was able to qualify for disability. So I had to wait. And in the meantime, what was I supposed to do? So I tried to get a job and they had this program and it was supposed to help people with disabilities, you know, make the transition. And in the process, it was one of these things. There was a maximum amount of number of hours you could work so that you would make a certain amount of money. And if you went over that, you would not be qualified for receiving disability benefits. And anything under those number of hours, especially while you were waiting for the disability uh, insurance claim to come back, you couldn't live on in any way, shape or form, especially in San Francisco. And so it's like this situation where for several months you're being pulled in all these different directions over and over again. I'm trying really hard to do this job right now because I need this job while I'm waiting for them to come back with the claim to tell me whether or not I'm going to be able to qualify for the disability benefits and it's really hard and it's really bad and I can hear all of these things going on and they're telling me I'm hallucinating but I'm doing it's happening again where I'm like hearing something and then I see it on the news and I know it's just a hallucination but I got to focus on doing this job. So you start doing things very simple at first, you know, putting paper together. Maybe you start making a spreadsheet. You show very basic competence. And then you're like, okay, we're going to try you out for another job. And you start doing, you know, talking to people on the phone, people coming in the door. And you're like, okay, you know what? I can do this. And you're in an environment where people are supportive because you're disabled. And then that time comes around and you're like, okay, you know what? If I had a little support, I could do this job. And not only could I do this job, I could work full time. I don't want, then all of a sudden the, the claim comes back. Oh, you've been denied. What? Well, they denied it, but you can appeal. And usually upon appeal, you can succeed. And if it doesn't the second time, you could go the third time and we'll take you to court. And it almost always succeeds after the third time. And I'm like, so how long? Well, within six months. So I have to spend another six months. I have to spend another six months proving I'm too disabled to work in order to qualify for disability. And I just spent six months doing the best I could. You know what? I'm not appealing. Somehow I'm going to put my mind back together and I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to figure out how to have a job. I'm not appealing. Okay, well, you were denied disability insurance, but they have decided that you are, just, you are due back disability. What? Well, they did decide that for those two years, you didn't have any reported income, that you were disabled. And as a result of that, you do qualify for disability benefits for those two years. Now, nobody said when they give you that disability payment, what they're saying is they're claiming your human capital and everything you did in those last two years with everybody you did it with. It's now... Whoever gets access to the derivative agreements associated with your Social Security and Medicare billings. Nobody told me that. What they said is that they had already determined that because I was disabled for the prior two years legally, that I was entitled to benefits. And so they would give me a one-time lump sum to pay for those two years. Now, if anybody had been honest with me about understanding informed consent, about what it meant that when I went into the emergency services, that I said, I understand that somebody is trying to send me some sort of vibrational uh, technology that is trying to get me to agree that I committed crime or that I will commit crime in the future. That's all I needed to say. And somebody should have been there to talk with me and to talk me through that and make sure I understood what it meant to accept somebody else telling me that they had determined that I had a chemical imbalance in my brain. And because of that, I was mentally ill. They didn't say that that mental illness designation also 
challenged concepts of fitness to stand trial or mental competency to engage a contract relationship or perhaps even capacity to care for oneself and make informed decisions about one's own livelihood and hence would allow for a possibility that somebody else could be put into a role as a form of guardian or custodian of the assets connected to my estate or the estates of others that I might be an inheritor of. Now, if they had told me that, I would have been, well, and I'm going to tell you honestly, you know what the first thing I would have said? I need to speak to my priest. I'm not going to lie. He was the one who took me there. And if they had told me any of that, I would have said, I need to speak to Pastor John. And then I would have talked to him, and we would have talked it through. But that didn't happen. And Pastor John is dead. Pastor John was disabled to the point that by the time I was considered to be stabilized enough to get paychecks on my own, he was already dead. He died of a brain tumor. Yeah, I felt it. Right here. It was nice. It's not the same as it was back then. You got a different light signature. Are you trying to swap out the patent? Are we in that period of time where... The reverse engineering that was done at that point in time has been completed, and now that technology is available for somebody else to try to experiment on for any number of years. I mean, in 22 days, we're going to come up on the four-year anniversary of when I was strategically re-entered in a scenario like that under completely false pretenses. See, that time I said, I'm here because I need to speak to a mandated reporter of child abuse and fraud. Everybody I'm speaking to is a mandated reporter of child abuse. I need to file a report on child abuse. Anyway, I was talking about my problem with drug abuse. Oh, yeah. So I got out of there, and they gave me a check for $24,000. And I didn't know what $24,000 meant. But I knew as soon as I got the check, as the check was coming in the mail, which I didn't realize at the time, something was saying, you took a bribe, you took a bribe, you took a bribe. What? I didn't take any bribe. What are you talking about? You took a bribe, you took a bribe, you took a bribe. Now, before it was coming in the mail, as soon as they told me about it, you know what I did? I made a plan. I had some debts, including this debt I had with somebody I used to know who I, for a while, considered a friend. And I was like, this is enough money for me to pay him back. I can pay him back. But then you took a bribe, you took a bribe, you took a bribe. And I'm like, whoa. And then something else, something in me that wasn't that voice, by the way. It wasn't those kind of, something else like, don't. Don't pay him with that. Put it in savings. What? Put it in savings. I didn't know why. I know now. Well, I started to get my job, and then I got a second job. And technically, I could have worked about 35 hours a week. That was the understanding between my two jobs. But something would happen in my second job. I would go, and even though I would be scheduled to work four hours a day every afternoon, for some reason, by what amounted to about 2.30 in the afternoon every single day. I was ready to go. Job's done. My job's done. I don't have anything else to do. I would just be on the clock pretending to work to make money. But the truth of the matter is my job is done. Because my proxy was not in California. Right? No. Not in California. That window didn't close till 5.30 on the East Coast, did it? Yeah. So what am I doing there? Yeah, the accountant was in New York City, right? You want to keep going with this? You want to keep playing this game? It's not a fucking game. You kidnapped me twice in 10 fucking years. 